All right, there we are. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Freek van Leyen, um, uh, presenting from you from, from Delft in the Netherlands, actually. And together with uh, my colleague uh, Frances Francesca Sinja, uh, I'm chairing today uh, this uh, session on uh, the application of uh, INSAR for the built environment. Um, we have five presentations uh, in this uh, session, and actually we will be covering uh, quite uh, different topics, uh, going from uh, bridges to offshore platforms at different locations in the world. So I think it's going to be uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, I would like to remind you that uh, during uh, these presentations, you have the possibility to pose your questions in the chat box at, uh, at the Brella system, so that uh, certainly at the end of this session, we will have time to, uh, to uh, address these uh, together uh, with you and the speakers of today. Um, these are the logistics, so I uh, propose to get started right away, not to lose any more time. Uh, so let's get over to our first, first presenter, which is uh, Andrew Branson from Queen's University, who's going to tell us about uh, the use of Sentinel-1 interferometry uh, for uh, urban monitoring. Uh, Andrew. Um, can I share? I think so. And uh, the button's still grayed out for me. Ah. Oh, got it. Okay. All good? Yep. Okay, well, uh, good morning or afternoon or evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Branson. I'm presenting work done on the use of Sentinel-1 data for the detection of nonlinear deformation trends in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. The Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, or DFM, has a long history of flooding events culminating in the flood of 1908, which resulted in the deaths of 11 people and displacement of 4,000 more. A large amount of investment has gone into the flood mitigation infrastructure um, to prevent the continuation of these tragedies. These include numerous dam and levee systems. Implementing effective monitoring solutions is essential for the long-term security of this area. Solutions which we investigate include the use of persistent scatter interferometry, interferometry and um, as well as a comparison of LIDAR and tandem X. So however, with a vertical accuracy of seven and 15 centimeters uh, between different data sets analyzed, the precision of this method wasn't capable of um, detecting changes of the precision which we required. The DFM contains a large regional deformation signal due to the, or large seasonal deformation signal due to the swelling of expansive soils. Seasonal trends in deformation time series are a common feature among PSA in persistent scatter analysis, often caused by situations such as water loading as observed in Southern Ontario, active layer uh, freeze thaw cycles as observed in uh, permafrost affected regions, as well as thermal expansion and contraction is often observed in uh, infrastructure uh, analysis. A large amount of Sentinel-1 data is available and with a repeat cycle of 12 stays, it, makes the po it allows the possibility of sampling these seasonal trends. So throughout Dallas, the bulk of the flood risk occurs along the Trinity River uh, flowing south through Carrollton and east through Fort Worth and Arlington as well as downtown Dallas. And on the left here, you can see why this issue exists, just to give you an idea of the hydrology of the area. So we acquired 97 ascending Sentinel-1A scenes acquired in, interferomet in interferometric wide swath mode between December uh, 26, 2015 and November 11, 2019. Uh, this here is the footprint of the, um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, on the wrong screen. This here is the footprint of the um, the acquisition, and we processed a full two subswaths of this acquisition. Uh, 19 permanent GNSS stations are located inside this uh, processed footprint, uh, which you can see there. And the red uh, circles represent the polygons that we used to extract the persistent scatterers uh, for our validation. So our methodology, we selected our stack using this uh, for use in the STAMPS TSI analysis. 
using the ASF uh, baseline tool. We downloaded the stack and processed it using uh, the Snap to Stamps workflow developed by um, Doblasco, uh, which is a series of um, processing graphs which run on the uh, Sentinel application platform, which prepares the stack for use in uh, stamps. We ran the uh, stamps PSI analysis on the prepared stack and extracted the PHMM output from stamps, which includes the um, the uh, persistent scatter time series of the output. We input this. Um, we input the GNSS station coordinates into a modified version of stamps, uh, and then use this to extract persistent scatters located nearby these GNSS stations. As well, we input uh, the vertical position time series of these GNSS stations and input those into the Torrance and Compa wavelet analysis software. We took the scalograms and the global wavelet spectrum and used those to compare to analyze whether both, um, both time series were able to observe the same frequency uh, seasonal deformation. So the output of our stamps uh, analysis gave us over 3.5 million persistent scatters through the two uh, full subswaths. And it's very clear where you you can see where the uh, urban infrastructure is around the DFM, as well as numerous um, numerous towns outside it, as well as major highways. Here's just an example of the density of our, our PS. Uh, again, they're very strongly correlated to the urban infrastructure, as well as outside towns and major highways. So the PSs near the stations were extracted and compared using first a time series analysis and then a wavelet analysis. Uh, for this example, I'll be showing data extracted beside, uh, from within 100 meters of the TXSR GNSS station. The TXSR GNSS mo monument is located on grass surrounded by parking lot and several buildings with metal roofs uh, within 100 meters, which is represented by this red circle, uh, 16 PSs were extracted. This is the just position uh, time series of both the vertical position, uh, the vertical position time series of the GSS stations uh, is shown in blue, and the um, persistent scatter time series shown in red. Uh, the bars represent one year intervals, uh, just to give a better interpretation of when you're seeing the peaks in the seasonal deformation. Um, so you can see the the PS series you can sort of see uh, there is some sort of annual trend visible through this um, display. Uh, and with the GNSS data, you are able to see there is an annual and semi-annual deformation signal. However, down here, you see there's a clear drop in the um, PS data with rapid substance and uplift. So if we look into the individual scatters, we can break it down and we can see uh, there's actually a group of scatters that rapidly subside together and uplift together. So this is likely the result of a, a uh, reflector such as the building, uh, likely one of the buildings with the metal roofs, uh, simply behaving differently and non-representative of the local, ge local uh, geology, um, likely due to just different settlement design, different local geology foundation design, um, which results in it behaving separately than the rest of the PS. Uh, so if we look at the output of the Torrance and Compla wavelet analysis software, um, you can see at the top you have this um, the detrended vertical position time series to the GNSS station. Again, you can see that annual signal and semi-annual signal. And then in the middle you have the, the scalogram analysis. So in the blue, for example, at 0.25, uh, so that's about three months, you have very low um, intensity of that uh, wavelength signal in the data at that point in time. And then with, um, then let's say at 2018, at the, one year, at the one year wavelength, you have a very strong signal coming through. Uh, that's just an example of how the scalogram works. And on the bottom, you have the variance in your time series. On the right is just the global wavelet spectrum. So then you can look, there's clearly, you can observe in this scalogram, the 0 0.5 year um, period of the uh, signal, uh, and then later at the end of the 
uh, time series, you can see the clear annual signal in the GNSS data. And this corresponds to a, a dual peak in the uh, global wavelet spectrum. So then if we look at the uh, persistent scatter analysis, you, the detrended time series at the top, and you can see a very clear annual signal here. Uh, the data had to be detrended, of course, otherwise the long-term signal would dominate uh, the uh, results. Um, and here you can see a very clear annual uh, signal coming through in the data, along with the, norm, the global wavelet spectrum. And then if you look at the variance, you see a very high spike here with the corresponding to this drop in the um, position time series. This corresponds exactly to the drop, which you can see in the mean uh, I showed earlier with that building, which subsided and uh, uh, rapidly uplifted. So variable levels of correlation between the GNSS stations and the persistent scatters were observed. These are controlled by several factors, such as the distance between the GNSS stations and the scatters. The best correlated stations were all um, had numerous PS within 100 meters, which was our minimum search radius. Um, as well, this is just attributed to the first law of geography, things which are closer are more related than things that are far away, as well as local variation in the PS deformation behavior uh, can be attributed to different settlement rates and local variations in your reflectors. The rely and then of course, the reliability of the phase unwrapping and other processing errors. So some of the GSS stations showed very similar wavelet scale grams to the persistent scatter time series, which were extracted. And STAMPS PSI was detect capable of detecting uh, nonlinear deformation signals, uh, which were similar in a lot of cases to the GSS stations located nearby. Um, the availability to validate this result was limited by several factors, such as the distance between the scatters and the GSS observation points, as well as local variations in ground movement. This validates the use of STAMPS persistent scatter interferometry analysis of uh, Sentinel 1 data for observing nonlinear deformation. I'd like to thank you, to say thank you to the Geophysics and Geodesy Group at Queen's University for supporting this work. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the helpfulness of the Sentinel Toolbox Exploitation Platform uh, Forum, which provided an invaluable reference for uh, processing and SNAP snap the stamps and the stamps workflow, as well as the main SAR Google group, which was very helpful in troubleshooting through the stamps workflow. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, for uh, for your your presentation. Um, and thanks for uh, uh, sticking to the time. That's uh, very convenient for us as, uh, as the chairs of this session, um, because we have a little bit of time. I, I actually had one question related to your uh, presentation, um, and you, um, you uh, use this, uh, this software tool to do your uh, wavelet analysis. I was wondering, um, do you have to um, uh, apply some specific settings for this analysis, or is this tool able to uh, to retrieve your uh, time series analysis uh, straight away, let's say, or how does it um, work? No, you do need to play around and work with the data. Um, we use the Morlet wavelet, so you, we chose your wavelet and several other parameters. Um, and for example, different wavelets had different performances uh, and results on different time series. Um, but to be consistent across time series, we stuck with the Morlet. Um, right. Uh, and then that was probably the most significant decision we made. Um, I can't remember what the alternatives were, um, but we did play around and just to determine what the best results would. Uh, right. Be right. From. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Clear. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Over to uh, Francesca. Thank you. Thanks again to Andrew for keeping the times right. And uh, if you have any other questions from for Andrew or for any of the other speakers, please remind uh, uh, yourself to write them down in slide and we will try to address them straight away or later at the end of the session. So we move to our next speaker, who is Fernando Grini from MDA Canada, who will be talking about uh, monitoring uh, Canadian highway bridges using INSAR. So uh, Fernando, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so one, please allow me to share my uh, screen, please.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are in the world. Uh, thanks for joining today to this talk. I'm going to talk about applying e search for monitoring bridges. So just a quick overview, a little bit of background. We know the impact of climate change is increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, which threatens the integrity and sustainability of transportation infrastructure. Highway bridges are a critical component to Canada transportation network and require modern monitoring technologies to provide warning against potential failures and identify aging infrastructure. Typically, bridges are um, inspected and there's ground surveys leveling that are carried out at discrete points in time, but sometimes reconciling all that information can be challenging uh, to bridge engineers. So here is where INSAR is a useful tool to monitor bridges since it provides high resolution displacement measurements at regular time intervals over large areas with millimeter accuracy. The objective of this work was to evaluate the feasibility of using INSAR to systematically monitor uh, bridges. And this work we analyzed for Canadian bridges and we validated our observations using uh, numerical and analytical models. So I'll, I'll first introduce you into the bridges we analyzed. First is the North Channel Bridge. This is a bridge that is located in the province of Ontario. It has, it's, it's a relatively small bridge. It's 330 meters um, by 15 meters in width. It consists of four spans. It has medium length spans. It has two steel railings in the sidewalks. And adjacent to the bridge, there's some old piers from a previous uh, um, bridge that was located in that portion. Now these piers are not there anymore, but it's worth to mention that at the time of the sensing, those piers were present there. Its orientation is north-south. The second bridge was the Victoria Bridge located in the city of Montreal. This bridge is uh, larger. It's uh, two kilometers uh, by 20.4 uh, meters in width. It consists of 26 spans of medium length. It has a steel truss superstructure. It, it, it's, uh, it contains the roadway and next to it a railway and the bridge is oriented east-west. The next bridge is the Jacques Cartier Bridge, also located in the city of Montreal. This is, um, this is a two-component two bridge, but we were specifically interested in monitoring section six and seven, which is the one we are looking at the, at the, at the picture. It consists of four spans. These are long spans. It has a steel uh, truss superstructure and two steel towers, and its orientation is west. And finally, also we look into the Confederation Bridge. This is a pretty large bridge. It's almost nearly 13 kilometers in length, but, but it's, it's very um, narrow in width. You can see it's 12 uh, meters. It's just a two lane bridge. It consists of 43 spans, long spans. In general, it doesn't have a superstructure like these other two bridges. It just contains smooth surfaces and its clearance is variable. It goes from 20 meters to uh, 60 meters in the central portion of the bridge, and its orientation is northeast, southwest. As you can see, all bridges have very different characteristics. And here is just a review of the SAR data sets. We mostly use uh, spotlight imagery from RADSAT 2 from opposite viewing directions. We have pre major stacks. For the configuration bridge, we needed to use ultrafine since uh, spotlight scene couldn't cover the entire bridge. Uh, length. So we moved to ultrafine. It has uh, around three meters resolution. And this is just a quick overview of the outputs that we can obtain from INSAR. Uh, typically, we obtain uh, displacement measurements um, and, of course, linear rates. Of course, this provides critical information about the infrastructure health. But in this project in particular, we were interested in utilizing thermal dilation. Basically, this is the response of the bridge. Uh, to changes in ambient temperature. And this is the information they actually we use to validate against analytical models. Here is an example for the Victoria Bridge. Basically, we have a descending and descending pass directions. We constructed a bridge coordinate system. This is using uh, precise bridge drawings that were provided to us by the bridge operators. And basically, we geocoded and projected to, to this bridge coordinate system. Then we were able to decompose this information instead of using the typical vertical east-west component, we decompose it into the longitudinal and normal to that component. And finally, we extracted the information of interest. 
Now, it's worth to mention that uh, the analytical models were uh, computed completely independently from the answer. So at the end, we just came and compared those measurements to validate our INSAR observations. Here, the predictions are shown in, in the dark line and the INSAR measurements in the red dots. And we can see there's a very good agreement. There's, you, we can nicely observe the variations for each span and even other smaller variations like this small portion that is a uh, track diversion where the railway separates from the bridge. And there's of course a different behavior for that portion and it also captured by the INSAR. Now uh, I have here an example for the Jack Cartier bridge. Here for the longitudinal component, we have a good match in the first 140 and last 140 meters, but the match is very poor in the central portion. It happens for both longitudinal and vertical component. We inspected this a little bit more in detail, and uh, we projected the, the, um, the analytic, well, these were uh, finite element models. We projected them into the line of sight, and we can observe that for the descending stack, we have a very good match uh, between INSAR and the, and, the, and the models itself, but not for the ascending stack. And we find, based on backscatter analysis, that this was mostly affected, this viewing geometry was mostly affected by layover effects and shadow effects. So it's very important uh, to the selection of the proper uh, uh, viewing geometry for monitoring bridges. Here we have another example. This is for the North Channel Bridge. Here we have the solution in the range Doppler coordinate system for the sending and descending stacks. Uh, there's two observations here. One is for the sending stack, we have very nice CTV along that longitudinal component to this thermal validation component, but we don't have that uh, same sensitivity for the descending uh, pass, this is less sensitive. And this is because this is almost oriented uh, north-south and we know it's, it's, it's sorry, is uh, basically uh, less, less sensitive to that component. Now, another critical aspect is here, we can observe all the targets like in the railings, uh, but it's important to do a, back, a rather backscatter analysis to understand from where are coming all these returns. So in an instance, we can observe here, we have the railings, here we have the returns from the, the old piece from uh, the previous bridge. But what's happening here in the descending stack, uh, we only observe one railing. So using bridge drawings, we perform a, a detailed bridge analysis. We can assert that the first return of the old piece is in here, but there is a double bounce return with uh, uh, that it's affecting and it's overlapping with the east railing. So you can see that we have less number of persistent scatters in this portion. Now, also we analyzed like double bounce effects of the girder and the east railing. And, and these completely, these uh, reflections overlap with the west railing. So basically we have a very me uh, small number of, of, of PS targets for this case. So this of course exemplifies the importance of selecting the proper viewing geometry for monitoring different bridges. Finally, we have here the conformation bridge. Uh, in this case, we started using a uh, PS INSAR. Unfortunately, we found very low number of persistent targets, around eight targets per kilometer, and those targets didn't have like the best quality. We apply a homogeneous distributed scatter and apply a low threshold to so, observe if we could obtain um, uh, this component of thermal sensitivity. We were able to capture some of that information properly. But in, in general, it's inconsistent. Here we are observing those variations along 10 spans when we should observe something more uh, roughly similar to what we observe in here. So there is no good match against um, the predicted models. So what's going in here? Here we have a typical uh, scene intensity image for a summer scene. Here we have for one scene, uh, winter scene. You can observe that there's an increase in the backscatter and this increase is associated with the formation of ice. So the, this uh, formation of ice, of course, uh, affects the signal to color ratio and of course contaminates the phase of, of our measurements. So we further investigated if, if, if it was possible to obtain a better quality. So we conducted a small uh, corner reflector study. Uh, basically, we first started in analyzing the rather backscatter of, of that ridge using archive imagery and then based in, in corner reflector size, uh, signal to color ratio, uh, different viewing geometries and, and particularly contextual information from the bridge, we selected optimal locations to install these corner reflectors to get the best result possible. So we have pre-built corner reflectors of, with inner legs of 52 centimeters. So these were the optimal locations we found. 
and we analyzed around 16 for uh, each uh, of these stacks. These were installed at the Confederation Bridge and at the North Channel Bridge, but we were particularly interested in the Confederation Bridge where our results were not optimal. Here we have an example of the full scene for those uh, six scenes. We can assert that the first three scenes um, are clear of ice, but the following scenes have formation of ice. And this is exactly what we were, wanted to observe, right? What's the impact of that in the corner reflectors? We were observing some of the subsets around the corner reflectors. Here we can see this strong backscatter return. But, and, and also we can observe that this uh, strong backscatter is also occurring during the icy conditions. So these are performing well. We even uh, um, analyzed this, uh, the performance of the corner reflectors with time. We have a limited uh, number of, of, of data set number, limited number of scenes, but we can observe that the radar cross section performs very good. There's a slight decrease when we come into winter scenes, but in general is good. Uh, same is with spectral diversity. We, 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 it has very high spectral diversity above 0 0.8, persistently around 0 0.9. And particularly, signal to chloride ratio is high in all cases. We see again a decrease when we go close to uh, with scenes coverage that have winter conditions, but the signal to chloride ratio is, is is high. Even it's considered that around 16 or to 18 dB above that, even they push above 13 dB, we can have good uh, phase measurements. And this also can be directly translated into displacement error that persistently remains below the 0 0.2 uh, millimeters. Also, we did a one-to-one -one comparison between the phase uh, measurements between both corner reflectors. These were separated by around uh, 30 meters. And just to say that the phase is consistent between both of those. And we can observe that, yes, the phase is consistent. It, it lies very nicely along the one-to-one -one line. What is worth noting is that like the warm colors follow very nicely along the one-to-one -one line, but these polar colors uh, are a little bit shifted toward this side. So we further inspected these. We computed uh, the difference between the phase between coronary reflector two, coronary reflector one, and for all the pairs. And also we did the same thing with ambient temperatures and we can assert there's a strong correlation to these variations in temperature. So in summary, I mean, um, wide scale inside bridge monitoring uh, requires, we find it requires using high resolution sorry, imagery. And an important aspect is the proper selection of a viewing geometry. This was demonstrated there. I showed two cases where um, insert results were not optimal for two of those cases, but for the other viewing geometry, where the results were very, very good. Two pass directions is useful maybe for research purposes, but it's really not required for operational purposes. Backscar analysis is a key component to interpret results, even for installing corner reflectors or in understanding the different effects that uh, different components of the bridge uh, have, like impact of shadow layover and multi-bounce effects. Um, we found, of course, that PS insert is better suited to monitor bridges. Uh, using um, techniques like homogeneous distributed scatter can uh, bias the phase measurements uh, very, very fine detail um, bridge elements. And in general, I mean, the corner reflector had good performance. At that specific locations, we couldn't even install smaller corner reflectors basing our analysis and, and we, those would perform well. So this is all, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Fernanda. This was, uh, this was an, uh, an extremely interesting talk full of technical details that I'm sure will stimulate a lot of questions for you. So if you have any questions for Fernando, please uh, write them down in the slider and we will address them at the end of the session. Thank you. All right, then it's uh, time for our next presentation and uh, it's uh, Francesca's turn. So Francesca will take us to uh, Haiti to uh, show us uh, her work on the uh, hurricane uh, Matthew uh, they are using in the GAP platform. Francesca. Yes, let me share my screen. Okay, you should be able to see that now. I'll move this window across. 
Okay, so hello everybody again. In this work, our uh, goal is to show you how we use the ESA's Geohazard Exploration Platform to uh, monitor uh, ID after the impact of Hurricane Matthew. As you can see from this first slide, this is uh, the result of a joint work from a very large team involving several space agencies, several companies, and last but not least, the National Center for Geospatial Information of IED. So this work um, was uh, kicked off and run in the framework of the so-called Recovery Observatory IED project that was triggered at the end of 2016 by the Committee uh, for Earth Observation Satellites uh, to respond uh, to the need of the Haitian community after the impact of Hurricane Matthew that hit ID as a category for hurricane in October 2016. As you can see from the photographs, the impacts and the damage caused by the hurricane was huge. So this project was uh, um, also involved a lot of humanitarian actions uh, uh, to help and support the community that was impacted. In terms of economic loss, the total economic loss uh, due to this um, uh, event was around uh, 1.9 million US dollars, and there were more than 540 people killed. So this is considered the worst uh, disaster occurred in Haiti after the, the earthquake that hit Port-au-Prince in 2010. So it was our objective to provide support to the local community. And with this goal in mind, uh, the National Center for Geospatial Information together with uh, French space agency, CNES, put together a strong team involving space agencies, and not only uh, those, but a team of uh, local, uh, national, and international stakeholders involved in disaster risk management activities, uh, with the goal to demonstrate the value of using satellite Earth observation data to support the monitoring of the recovery phase after major disaster and to work with the recovery community to define a sustainable vision for increased use of EO in daily activities for land monitoring and land management. So to achieve our goals, what we did in the project, it was to generate a number of thematic products of different levels uh, based on optical and radar uh, satellite data. The products were uh, generated according to seven different categories that are summarized in these slides. As you can see, they uh, cover the most impacted area of IED, so southwestern IED, and they were accord, uh, classified according to typology. So here are some examples of product that we, we generated. For instance, uh, built area status mapping based on uh, high resolution play out data to understand how many uh, housings were destroyed, how many were damaged, how many were partially damaged. This was uh, particularly important for the community to understand the impact of the hurricane. So um, in the center, you can see an example of land cover products based on optical data and open street map, uh, allowing us to uh, monitor any changes in the land cover after the hurricane due to new urbanization, new uh, management actions, uh, taken by the locals. And uh, to the right, you can see an example of uh, residual flood risk uh, mapping products combining optical and radar to uh, check any residual risk after the hurricane in the most hit uh, territories. But in this talk, we will be focusing on the second group of thematic products, which is called the rain motion and change detection, which combine both the use of optical data and SAR data. The optical data products were generated by a group led by the University of Strasbourg, and were focused on the detection and mapping of mass movements using, for instance, spot six and seven data in the Aladdin method. And uh, the other group of products was generated by a team led by the Italian Space Agency using SAR data, change detection methods, but also conventional and advanced interferometric methods to look at both land subsidence and, and slope instability in general and landscape changes. 
through change detection methods. To achieve uh, the generation of these products, we use the Geohazard Exploration Platform, which is part of the thematic exploration platforms um, man, uh, developed and, uh, by, by ESA. So it's a cloud-based environment where there are data, tools, and services that can be used by the community uh, with the aim to generate products and geo-information out of uh, um, Earth observation data for geohazard applications. So, based on this platform, we selected a number of available tools in the platform and we used them to generate our geohazard products. So here is an example of change detection products that were generated by using the SNAP uh, tool, which is based on uh, SLC Sentinel-1 data to create interferons, displacement maps, but also coherence maps based on pairs of star scenes. To the right, you see something similar, which is based on the SNAP um, tool, which uses clearly the SNAP toolbox as well, but starts from ground range detection detected products. And here at the bottom, uh, you can see an example of uh, those features that we could uh, identify by using these tools. For instance, here we compare data before and after the hurricane to detect flooded areas. And we use this approach to track, for instance, the time needed for the flooded area and the, for the flooding to dry out after the hurricane. In this slide here, uh, we see examples of advanced multi-temporal uh, processing of big uh, data stacks of Sentinel data. To achieve this goal, we use um, both persistent scatterers interferometric methods uh, through the FASTVEL tool, which was developed by Thierry Altamira, and also uh, small baseline subset methods like the PSBAS tool developed by CNR IREA. So in particular, this is a parallelized version of the conventional SBAS tool that was uh, uploaded and made available in the JEP and allows the generation of not only sets of coherent targets, but also the extraction of time series of the formation. So as you can see from these maps, uh, this is the typical layout of the output products that were generated. So a set of coherent or persistent scatters um, providing information of, on annual uh, ground motion along the line of sight occurred after the, the hurricane. So what did we detect by using these techniques? These are examples of things that we, we, we saw. So um, along the coastline to the west of the main town of Jeremy, one of the main towns that was uh, hit by the hurricane, uh, we went to the field in 2019 together with uh, the French Space Agency and the National Center for uh, Geoinformation of Haiti to check actually what was the situation in the field and to gather some ground truth. Um, as you can see, there is uh, a complex situation of uh, slope instability along the coastline, which involves uh, rock falls, detachment of huge boulders uh, of rocks that then uh, fall and slide down or roll down the, the cliff. To give you an idea of the size of these boulders, you can uh, compare the size of a human here uh, with the size of the boulder to see the impact that uh, such uh, rock falls could have if some elements at risk are, are, are there. So, um, as I said, you have risk when, where, when you have elements at risk, like houses and inhabitants. So, in many cases, uh, both uh, down the cliff and up the cliff, there are elements at risk, uh, like housing and, and factories, but also some, some key infrastructure, like at Jeremy Air, Airport. So, this is... Um, some important information that should be taken into account when using and exploiting the SAR uh, generated products for uh, risk management. So by looking into more details into uh, urbanized areas, this is an example to the left of a product after a PS processing with the FASTFEL tool. Uh, when we generated these products, we found a number of clusters of points indicating some significant motion um, 
uh, along the line of sight in the direction away from the satellite sensor. We couldn't understand exactly the meaning of those motions until we went to the field and we spoke with the locals to understand what was going on. As you can see to the right in these photographs, these clusters uh, match perfectly with new urbanization that was constructed after the hurricane. Basically, many of the people that were hit uh, who lived very close to the coastline decided to move a bit uphill uh, to build new housing uh, because their their houses were destroyed but here is um is the a, a very risky situation because they built the new housing sometimes on top of very weak geological ground so what we see here through uh, the satellite data is that there is um, a situation of high uh, risk for those new housing because uh, the land is compacting and also the, the soil is really weak, so uh, with rainfall this could be uh, generating a disaster. So, in addition to the um, regional view that we gather by using JEP and uh, Sentinel-1 data, we, um, together with the German and Italian Space Agency, tasked uh, tailored campaigns at high resolution, very high resolution, for uh, the whole uh, project area. With the TerraSRX uh, data were tasked in three path mode, so a three meter ground resolution to cover the whole uh, ID uh, area. And uh, Cosmos climate data were tasked at one meter resolution through the spotlight mode. These data were processed outside JAP, but helped to gather a more detailed understanding of the local processes, especially urbanization and new construction of uh, new roads and transport network that then should, should be monitored with attention. So, what we learned from this project is that the JEP could provide uh, a very good platform, especially for this kind of users to create products by using multi-sensor, multi-scale information from SAR data. With the help of the end users, we uh, managed actually to, to really transfer information from the SAR products to the locals because uh, we, we saw that these products were really uh, and actually helpful for the end users for their decision making actions and land management practices after the, the disaster during the recovery phase. Uh, one important technical point from our perspective is that the entire SAR data uh, processing chain was designed to work on the JEP with Sentinel-1 data. And this was a key goal for us because we wanted to have a, a chain that was fully transferable to the Asian partners. To ensure this transfer, uh, the French Space Agency has coordinated a very strong and huge capacity building plan, which included not only scientific and technical seminars and workshops, but also dedicating uh, training sessions and internships as well, one-to-one -one sessions that allowed us to ensure an effective transfer of the technical skills and knowledge to the Asian partners for them to use um, more and more SAR and optical data and derived products in their daily activities. So with this, uh, I just thank you also from the project team. And if you have any questions or are curious and would like to um, get more details about the project, you can always visit the project website or you can also access our short paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. Very uh, nice to see uh, both the, the first uh, versatility of the, the GAP platform and the, the, the capabilities of this platform on all the different tools that, you, uh, that you've used and showed. Uh, and also the, 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 the assistance it, it brings in, uh, in let's say, uh, sharing the, this knowledge and information with the local uh, users and, uh, and uh, giving them an opportunity to uh, get familiar with these, uh, these uh, tools and, uh, and products. Um, so uh, thanks for that. Um, then I give the word back to you uh, for our next uh, presentation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you very much. So our next presenter is Rafael Kadov from uh, Gamma Remote Sensing, and he will be uh, telling us about uh, using INSAR for construction planning in Greenland. So thank you very much, Rafael. The floor is yours.
Thank you, Francesca. Um, hi, everyone. Let me just quickly share my screen to you. I hope it arrives. So uh, let's switch to uh, a little bit colder regions of the earth. I want to present you the project uh, where we try to or where we link INSA remote sensing data with geotechnical in situ information and try to achieve an enhancement in construction planning in Greenland. It's part of the ESA Arctic Active Layer Monitoring pro uh, for Infrastructure Management project that is uh, done in collaboration with colleagues from DTU and ASIAC Greenland Survey. So if we look at infrastructure in the Arctic, it's similar as anywhere else in the world. We have uh, here, that's an example of a house. Actually, it's the Church of Itokotormit in Eastern Greenland. Uh, <clears throat> it consists of a structural element uh, above ground and uh, with the roof and walls. And the interface between the, the structural elements uh, and the soil is done uh, uh, with the foundation. Here we have a concrete slab foundation and it sits on the ground or partly within the ground. And in the Arctic environment, the ground has uh, special conditions. We are in permafrost conditions, meaning that large part of the subsoil uh, is permanently in frozen state. But on the topsoil, the top few decimeters to meters, they're subsequently uh, frozen and thawed uh, during uh, the annual cycle. And if you look around the house here, um, we have a soil, it's a mixture, mixture of uh, coarse grains and fine grains. And the fine grains would tell us uh, that they are capable of storing uh, lots of amounts of water. When we have water in the soil system during a freezing and thawing cycle, uh, it can lead to, to volume expansion and uh, subsequent volume ex expansion in the multi-annual cycle uh, can lead to uh, mechanical stresses in, of the foundations, for instance. And here you see some results. We have uh, can have cracks in the foundation. There can be serious that entire parts of the foundation tilt away, uh, leading as well to uh, potential damage in the upper structure. And we want to try to avoid this beforehand. Uh, another type of infrastructure in the Arctic are linear elements. Here, that uh, is shown a road, a uh, paved road. Uh, it can be as well uh, water lines or power lines um, spanning through or crossing through several soil types. And if a road crosses uh, a critical soil type um, with uh, uh, with a high uh, degree uh, of, of water content um, during the freezing and thawing cycles, it can lead as well to uh, non-reversible motion. As you see here, the result are, is a bumpiness in the road. And it's good to know uh, those, um, those critical soils before we construct an infrastructure element through an area that we can uh, provide uh, effective countermeasures. So again, back to, to, um, uh, to a schematic view of the active layer, that's the small layer on top that's hashed in blue, uh, that uh, freezes and thaws during the annual cycle. Um, it's important that we have water in it, as you can see in the small image with the drilling core, um, where it's you see a large, large amount of water ice and you can imagine the expansion within this uh, soil condom sample. So um, the fact itself, it's, it's nothing new. It's, it's, it's common knowledge and it's uh, accounted for in the uh, geotechnical and civil engineering planning. And it's measured usually usual, or is expressed usually with the term of the frost susceptibility of soils. And the frost susceptibility is actually, we measure the, the expansion of the soil uh, that gives us the amount of the frost susceptibility. But there are two uh, important terms uh, uh, linked with, with the 
expansion and that's the water content or the, here the, it's expressed as ice content and the height of the column we freeze and thaw again. And for construction planning, these three, all of these three terms are important uh, to know beforehand before a construction is done. So what we did, we uh, went and asked or approached uh, different stakeholders in Greenland that deal with uh, infrastructure planning and managing, that uh, deal with such problems on a, on a medium to large scale, uh, but as well on a, a, a such as the, the government or municipalities or the large infrastructure operations, but as well on the uh, small and local scale, the building wide scale, uh, with the private company that uh, uh, plans and builds actually then the uh, infrastructure elements. So the feedback was that in, in Greenland there is no uh, available base data that covers uh, these specific soil types. And when there is information available, it's only sparsely available. So non, uh, non, not a regional cover. Therefore, we try to link the, the INSAR heave data with other uh, data at different test sites uh, to, um, to map to try to map the, the frost susceptibility of these soils. So again, back to a conceptual model, um, it's based on, on previous work uh, that's referenced here. Um, in uh, the permafrost environment, the soil, uh, permafrost soil or the active layer uh, freezes and refreezes and induces a change in the surface elevation. Usually it's uh, it's not a, a linear deformation. We have a cyclic deformation uh, that's linked with the seasonal uh, cycles. Um, sometimes there is a, a, a linear trend uh, um, is a linear trend in the data, um, but we are interested in the amplitude, in the heave amplitude of the uh, of the active layer because it gives us directly the, the, the expansion, the soil expansion. But with the INSAR, we have a problem that uh, during snow cover, we can see that correlation. And therefore we deal with uh, incomplete time series. And it's already, uh, it was already proposed before um, in several publications that we could use uh, a simple Stefan's equation using the a very simple approach using the uh, thawing degree days uh, retrieved from the air temperatures to fill these gaps and calculate back the starting point of our thawing season that we're interested in. If we look now at uh, uh, INSAR uh, time series from uh, interferogram stacking at two different locations, uh, at two different test sites, uh, you see already differences. Uh, at, in, on the left, we have a time series of a point in, in Karnak. It's, it's in the northernmost, the northernmost settlement in Greenland. And on the right hand, we have uh, from Western, Midwestern Greenland, Ilulisat, a key, our key area. And you see the differences. In Karnak, we have almost a complete time series uh, because of the uh, very uh, little snowfall, uh, very, very dry condition during winter, while in Ilulisat we have uh, to calculate back the actual initial uh, starting point to get our uh, seasonal uh, heave amplitude. And below you see uh, uh, the map view of the seasonal amplitude here from 2019 That's that we take now uh, for the further uh, calculation. So that's the general uh, approach. You see here we use the INSAR temporal stack to get vertical displacements. Of course, that what I showed before was a line of sight. We use the simple uh, assumption that in the flat areas we only have uh, or mainly have the, the vertical motion component uh, to uh, project accordingly uh, our, uh, our data in the vertical. So now uh, that's one part. The more, more tricky part is now to solve one of the two remaining um, 
parameters, either the water content of the soil or the height of the active layer thickness. Um, they're both very variable uh, in the spatial domain. It's, it's very tricky to, to gather this information, so we decided to try it with the, an optical approach or actually the colleagues of DTU uh, did this part uh, using ground truth and optical satellite imagery uh, to use a land cover classification to try to calculate the, the active layer thickness on a spatial scale. And both together gives us the, the ice content or the frost susceptibility of the soils. So how does it look like? That's an um, overview of the Ilulisat area. You see on the base data the bedrock outcrops in the dark grayish colors and with the sand colors the sedimentary infills. And if I plot now the, the vertical displacement derived from INS or the uh, seasonal amplitude from 2019, you see the main motion, the main uh, thermal expansion of the, or the, the ice expansion uh, happens in the, in the unconsolidated settlements, uh, sediments, sorry. So what we did further, we tried to, or we did uh, separate the long-term linear trends uh, from the seasonal amplitudes. So here we have a, a long-term, meaning 2015 to 2009 is not that long at the moment, but time series will continue. And the average seasonal displacement, you see there is a room for improvement. We have uh, still noisy data. Um, but uh, the, the, the concept works, we can separate both uh, elements. And if we combine it now uh, with the active layer thickness derived from optical data, we can uh, get frost susceptibility maps um, showing us uh, zones with uh, a surface cover or sediment types that are more frost susceptible than others. And that's then the final product. Um, we deliver to the uh, the end user and they can test if it's uh, feasible for regional planning for for the uh, uh, management so we uh, deliver the data uh, using a web gis where we as well publish the the amplitude information derived from insar at the long term rate degradation, permafrost degradation rate, as you can see here, and ask the, the stakeholders for feedback and did some validation. It's, it's not, or the project is, is actually uh, finalized uh, currently, and um, this, the first stakeholder feedbacks are already positive, but uh, we need a little bit more time or uh, one has to work with the data actual to, to get the proper feedback. Um, so therefore the usefulness of the data will show within the next month. And of course there we see a lot of uh, small possible in potential improvements that we can make on the INSAR uh, retrieval. Uh, here we did only a let's say a global for a small, for, the, for each settlement, one global starting and ending point to determine the amplitudes, but we could do it as well uh, pixel-wise, as for instance, Lin showed in her presentation yesterday. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Um, thank you, and yes. Thank you very much to you. It was extremely interesting again. So I don't see any specific question for you in the Slido yet, but of course you'll be here to answer any of them at the end of the session. So I'll pass to my lead chair. All right, thanks uh, Francesca. Uh, yeah, time for our final presentation of today and we will move offshore to uh, monitor uh, offshore platforms uh, using Sentinel-1. Uh, and I think we have a guest presenter for this presentation.
Hi, I'm Sean, and it's my pleasure today to present together with my colleagues Malte Föge and Regula Fraunfelder from the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. The topic of our presentation today is the detection and the monitoring of offshore platforms using Sentinel-1 data together with persistent scatterer interferometry. First, a little background. There are offshore structures in all parts of the world with many different foundation types. In this case, we are talking about gravity-based structures that are fixed to the sea floor with permanent foundation systems. These are typically some of the largest uh, offshore structures, and they are highly instrumented throughout the operational service life. Some structures may experience settlements due to self-weight or due to nearby production activities. Settlements may be predicted as well as directly monitored on the platform using, for example, continuous GNSS measurements or air gap measurements between the platform and the sea surface. There have been a small number of studies that used high resolution SAR data to detect and to monitor the stability of some offshore structures, but we wanted to test the viability and the performance of using Sentinel-1 data. For this, we identified two case studies one in the Adriatic Sea and another located in the Caspian Sea. In our first case study, which is depicted on the right side of this slide, the Adriatic LNG terminal is a large platform that was installed in 2009. It was also the world's first gravity-based offshore liquid natural gas production facility. The Adriatic LNG terminal is located approximately 15 kilometers off the Veneto coast and is about 40 kilometers southeast of Venice. The analysis included two stacks of IW uh, mode data, each with about 40 scenes covering the majority of 2018. Subsets of the data in the areas of interest immediately around the structure were extracted from each SLC and were subsequently co-registered to a single master. Flattening of the interferograms was performed with the help of an SRTM model that was prepared with modified ellipsoidal height over the ocean. Inversions were performed to estimate velocity using a linear displacement model and to remove the atmospheric phase screen component. Finally, the resulting persistent scatterers were geocoded. A first analysis, which preserved only those scatterers with a temporal coherence threshold exceeding 0.75, resulted in approximately 300 scatterers for both the ascending and descending orbit stacks. For further analysis, the PS were reduced to only those with the temporal coherence threshold exceeding 0.9, leaving about 50 individual PS for the ascending stack and a little over 100 PS for the descending stack. The calculated mean vertical velocities were in the range of several centimeters per year, with both the ascending and descending stacks indicating relative differential, albeit varying settlements. Displaying the geocoded results uh, side by side for both analyses indicated that the geocoding was unreliable, which is not surprising uh, uh, given that this is an isolated target uh, with no possibility for stable reference points. Moreover, what exactly we are detecting and measuring in the model comes into question if potentially the entire platform is settling. That being said, the GNSS trends that were retrieved from three antennas on the platform surface generally indicated that the platform was settling several centimeters per year. Switching gears now to our second case study site in the Caspian Sea, we wanted to try to measure a difference in the settlements between two side-by-side -side platforms that were part of the same structure, but that had independent foundation systems. In these types of structures, it's common that one side is the production platform where one could reasonably expect settlements or upheave, while the other is used for accommodations and may therefore not be affected in the same manner. We selected two such structures, the Deepwater Gunashli and the Central Azeri platforms, both of which operate in the Azeri Shirag Deepwater Gunashli oil field complex, approximately 120 kilometers from Baku. Again, the analysis included two stacks of data, this time each with about 100 scenes that cover the period from 
about 2016 to early 2020. The same processing methodology was applied for each of the structures. Shown here are the results for the deepwater Ganoshli structure. In the ascending orbit analysis, scatterers with a temporal coherence threshold of 0.75 or better resulted in mean settlements that were less than one millimeter per year for the four and a half year period. For the descending orbit stack, there was an equal number of scatterers with a coherence above 0.75 but with far more being detected on the production side of the structure, where a mean of about one millimeter per year of uplift was calculated. The standard deviation for each set of measurements was about one millimeter per year, so we can't reasonably say that the measurements did not trend above what we could deem as stable. As with the Adriatic LNG terminal, the geocoding of the results was poor, and an offset of approximately 100 to 150 meters was observed between both data sets. It's clearly visible here between the ascending marked in green and descending marked in red scatterers on, on the platform. For the second structure, the central Azeri platform, the detected scatterers on the western platform appeared to be stable over the four and a half year period, but there was clearly a radar shadow effect. Likewise, for the descending orbit data, the structure was stable though there were far fewer reliable scatterers above our arbitrary coherence threshold of 0.75. So it was difficult to say with confidence if there was any measured relative difference between the two sides of the structure. We should mention also that the Caspian Sea platforms are significantly smaller than the Adriatic LNG terminal. So the mean power image was oversampled here for better delineate, delineation of the platforms. Again, we observed a poor match in the geocoding results of the descending and the ascending orbit data sets. And to summarize the work that we presented here, we can draw the following conclusions. Parts of each of the platforms are covered with a good number of scatterers, but the coverage was highly dependent on the geometry of the structures. Second, the comparison between ascending and descending orbit data indicated that radar shadow may have played a part, particularly in the Caspian Sea structures. The spatial resolution of the data did not enable the pinpointing of substructures, and the geocoding results were inaccurate. While we had GNSS measurements for the Adriatic uh, case study, we did not have independent data from the platforms that could be used to verify the INSAR results for the two Caspian Sea structures. There may also be other effects that could influence the results, particularly for some types of offshore structures where wave induced vibrations and thermal coefficients of concrete and steel foundations may cause diurnal or seasonal expansion and contraction. I'd just like to end with an acknowledgement of support from the Norwegian Space Agency and the Research Council of Norway, as well as the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. Thank you very much for listening to our talk and we'll be happy to hear any feedback or take any questions in the Q&A section of this session. All right. Uh, yeah, so as you understood, this was a recorded video, but uh, still uh, very uh, good uh, to be able to follow the story uh, in, uh, in this way. Um, and actually uh, a colleague of Sean, uh, Malte Feuge, is here to actually answer any questions you may have. So please still, uh, you're very much invited to pose your questions in the in the chat so that we can uh, uh, discuss these in uh, more detail. Um, all right. Um, yeah, this video was a little bit shorter than the typical time slot that we have for a presentation, but it's actually nice because that gives us more room for uh, a, a nice discussion uh, uh, based on the questions uh, you may have. So uh, I think, Francesca, we, uh, we can start. Um, Maybe yes, I exactly. give it to you first. <laughs> okay, exactly. So we've received a number of technical questions and a couple of comments. So uh, maybe we can go uh, speaker by speaker. Uh, if you agree, we can start with Andrew. So we have, uh, Andrew, we have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is about uh, any particular reason uh, for using wavelet processing of the Fourier analysis. Yeah, um, so we did originally try to use the Fourier analysis, 
Uh, however, due to missing acquisitions, uh, just we couldn't just do like a fast Fourier transform uh, because it requires um, evenly spaced acquisitions and like a regularly regularly sampled time series. Uh, so we tried doing a full Fourier analysis, um, but the results just weren't very good. Uh, and then we found this wavelet um, analysis tool uh, that was able to overcome the issues of missing acquisitions, as well as it also gives you the added benefit of observing um, how the the frequency and the signal changes over time. So the full Fourier analysis, you won't be able to tell that in the example I showed that you had uh, much stronger semi-annual signals in the uh, data, which later disappeared and became overshadowed by a, so a single annual signal. So there's it provides more uh, room for interpretation of your results. Thank you very much. Um, there's a second uh, question for you. Uh, so thanks for your presentation. Any other possible reason for the deformation discrepancy notice for some of the BS? Could it be attributed to the estimated APS, so atmospheric phase screen for that specific period and in that part of the scene, which included those PS? Um, I'm, certainly not, I'm certainly not gonna rule out that it definitely wasn't an error, um, but I don't think it would be APS because APS should be spatially correlated over a much larger area than the 100 meter search radius around that point. And there was a very select cluster of points or moving in a fairly uniform way uh, and those points were likely within 20 or likely within like probably 50 30 50 meters of other points that weren't moving so APS should have um, they should have all moved essentially in the same way over that spatial scale but it could have been unwrapping errors it could have been many different things um, but I don't believe it would be APS. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go with the next one, uh, which is for Fernando. So how dense should it be the corner reflectors network to properly perform the phase unwrapping? Oh, thanks. That That's a very good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we did some estimates. This would be, of course, very variable depending on the bridge where we install the corner reflectors. Specifically for the conferration bridge, the case I I presented here, uh, we did a rough estimation based in the analytical models of thermal sensitivity, and we found that we would need something around 30 meters. That's why we use that spacing. That's a very conservative value for this specific case. I think we could go even a little bit higher, up to 45 centi uh, sorry, 45 meters. Uh, but of course, it's something that. Uh, would need testing, but based in, in these models, 30 meters is is, is a very good um, spacing. Of course, this is, is a challenge, right? Installing a uh, very dense array on in such a large bridge, 13 kilometers bridge, um, it would be um, a huge thing to do, right? Installing so many corner reflectors, but well, it's, it's what uh, we can do at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Francesca, I have uh, another question for Fernando, if I may. Um, um, yeah. In uh, Fernando, in one of your slides, a bit towards the end, you uh, gave a number of uh, uh, characteristics of the performance, and one of them was uh, the uh, displacement error uh, assessment. Yeah. yeah. So you, yeah. and uh, this was, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, you put a number there below 0.2 millimeters. And yes. I was wondering, how did you assess this? How uh, did you have a, a, a reference measurement somehow? Or No, 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 this is, uh, I mean, ideally we wouldn't like to do that with a very dense um, stack of sorry measure to properly uh, estimate this value from amplitude dispersion uh, information. But for this specific case, it's just directly estimated from the signal to chlorine ratio. There's a direct relationship between the displacement error and the signal to chlorine ratio. You can find that in a paper from Garth Wade. So um, is that direct measurement? It's, it's what we can do with so short uh, number of scenes at the moment. Oh, okay. and, yeah. and, and, and in that paper in particular, uh, they speak uh, about using um, displacement error of below 0 0.1 millimeters, but they're talking more about uh, using large corner reflectors, more 
toward uh, like those large, like one mirror corner reflectors for doing uh, star calibration. In this specific case, we didn't want to be so strict in that sense. I mean, it, it, that was not a requirement that we didn't need to meet and 0 0.2, it was good enough for this specific case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, and now it's clear that you derived it from the signal to clutter ratio in your data. Yeah, yeah. Nice, exactly. to, nice to, to hear. Uh, a, a second question I have is, um, oh, yeah. you gave some very nice examples of, uh, let's say, for the success of your analysis, actually the selection of your data sets regarding instance angle and uh, loop direction is, uh, is very important. Uh, and in the, uh, regarding uh, multi-path effects, uh, layover, uh, shadow, shadowing effects. So um, can, can you elaborate a bit more on this? So uh, sh should everyone basically as a default do such a pre-analysis uh, beforehand before actually selecting your data sets? Well, yeah, I mean, I typically when I select um, um, one viewing geometry or a specific path direction to monitor a bridge, I mean, uh, without any contextual information from the bridge, like bridge drawings, uh, really, uh, when when you obtain this image, really you start noticing what are the effects. And if you don't properly estimate this a priori, I mean, you could be selecting something wrong, right? It could be either the path direction, as I show one case, maybe it's not sensitive to the, the formation because of the alignment of the bridge with respect to the, um, the track direction. Uh, but the other is, of course, all these layover effects. It depends on the bridge structure, how high is the bridge, what about the clearance with respect to the water. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's something important. All these double bounce effects, how they affect uh, the coherence in and how these things can overlap. So, I, I mean, it, it's very important to do this analysis prior to uh, selecting one of those tabs. Of course, for that, we are very dependent in bridge uh, drawings. We need to know all the um, um, SAR parameters, of course, like incidence angle, um, heading, and all this kind of information. But if we have this information, we can have some insight of particular bridge elements, like the railings. In the case of the railings, we can uh, ensure that we, we will not have any overlap, right? So these are things uh, we, we learn from this study in particular. Yeah, and I think also because you studied uh, uh, many different designs of bridges, eh? so I think this gives us a very nice overview of the possibilities. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Fernando. No problem. Uh, um, maybe we move on to, uh, and we may come back to you later, Fernando. If there's still time for other questions, uh, we'll, we will. Of course. We'll pose more to you uh, towards you. Um, then uh, regarding the presentation of uh, Francesca. Um, I don't think there's a particular question in the chat, uh, but simply a remark, uh, but a, a nice one uh, stating, I have no question, just wanted to say that this is a great initiative for uh, knowledge transfer and subsequent development in the area of risk man management and congrats to everyone uh, involved. So um, basically a compliment. So um, that's thank nice you. to hear. Uh, yeah, exactly. Francesca. Thank you. Thank you so much. This means a lot to us as a project team and I'll, I'll make sure to transfer your message to the project coordinators because uh, actually this was one of our goals to make sure that we could transfer something even basic, even basic knowledge about the data and what's the meaning of the data, especially with SAR, because as you know, it's not uh, always as user friendly as other uh, satellite data like optical. So we delivered our message to the to the local uh, uh, people. This was our uh, our scope and um, regarding knowledge transfer. Uh, what we found particularly important was the use of, uh, of the JEP as a platform ready to use and available online, um, especially in this context, because you need to consider this uh, ID is one of the poorest countries of the world. So sometimes infrastructure, and I mean hardware, like software, hardware, PCs can be an issue. Uh, even for technical departments, even for administrators, uh, the availability of uh, actual PCs and computers and software is an issue. So any effort like uh, 
any platform like the JEP and any other thematic platform is a key and vital resource that they can use to do something with their observation data, which otherwise would be totally impossible. So this was a, a key key point for our project. So I'll, I'll pass the congratulations to the coordinators. Thanks. Yeah, please do. That would be would be great. Um, but I, actually, uh, apart from this uh, this nice remark, uh, Francisca, I have uh, one also one technical question about your presentation. Um, you showed nicely that uh, using the GAP uh, platform, you actually applied two different let's call it INSAR processing chains: eh? the the fast fell and the the, the PSBAS uh, chain. And I guess we all know in this uh, in this community that uh, different uh, methodologies are sort of originally designed to to be more or less applicable for certain uh, phenomena and applications. Um, can you say something about let's say the differences in the results you obtained and how this affected your uh, further analysis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As you know, they, they exploit two different methods. So one is a persistent scatterers method and the other one is a coherent target methods. Uh, there is also, uh, so the, the main difference in terms of performance is in a country like Haiti was in terms of the number of uh, targets that we could get in such a, a vegetated and complicated, let me say, land. Uh, so, uh, an issue was about coherence uh, and also the identification of persistent scatters with the FASTBEL tool. So, uh, we had to, to make a number of trials, especially in uh, highly vegetated land, uh, to make sure that we could get some uh, good density of targets. And, uh, and also, it was an issue to, to, to find good uh, reference points in such areas because we we had to select very coherent uh, zones that uh, sometimes could be found only within the towns. But as you know, the towns were heavily hit by the hurricane. So that's an additional technical point on top of that. Um, there is also another technical difference between the two um, services in the job. So um, uh, uh, this, despite the PS uh, technique and the SBAS technique, both are capable to generate time series. Uh, in the JEP, only the PS bus technique can actually export the full displacement time series of, of the target. So we use that in particular to make sure that we could actually track the history of each coherent target in time. So that's another thing, technical thing that we have to keep in mind while running those uh, data processing. All right. Yeah, thanks for the, and this uh, analysis and assessment on the on these differences. Okay, I think it's a good moment to move on to our first uh, fourth uh, uh, presentation uh, by uh, Rafael. Um, I'll just read out the, the, there's one question uh, for you in the chat, uh, Rafael. So um, the, the the person asking is uh, uh, stating in your presentation the vertical displacements. Do you mean the line of sight displacements? or did you do any conversion? Uh, yes, thank you for the question and sorry for uh, not specifying maybe clear enough. Uh, I mixed a little bit the line of sight uh, data with the vertical uh, displacement data. Uh, if you remember, we uh, tried to gather the information on the, on the frost susceptibility and frost susceptibility is tested with a confined cylinder of a soil sample and the vertical expansion is measured. That's that's what is done with the with the field soil sample. And we try to to reproduce it with with uh, SAR interferometry and therefore we have to assume that we uh, are in a at, at the flatlands where the construction usually are made. We assume that it's the motion we see is mainly vertical or only vertical. Therefore we correct with a simple incidence angle uh, approach. Uh, of course, we, we know if we, if we move to, to inclined slopes, then we have um, downslope creeping. And we did not uh, account for that in our project yet. There are other possibilities um, to solve these problems, but uh, unfortunately in, in Greenland, we have only mainly one, only one geometry with the dense time series, the acquisitions. The other geometry usually is uh, in a different different acquisition mode from Sentinel-1. So 
we are aware of that fact and we try to compensate, but at the moment we are sticking at our assumption with the vertical motion. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you for, for, for answering. Actually, if, if any one of the other speakers has a question for somebody else, uh, please uh, also pose your question if you would like to. Uh, actually, uh, Rafael, I, I have a question. I was kind of uh, in, in, intrigued by, um, basically, you gave two examples uh, at a certain stage of what you call the seasonal uh, uh, effect, let's say. Yeah? And for one of the locations, you have a very coherent time series, basically all over the year. But for one, basically, uh, yeah, maybe only a few months, let's say, per year. And yes. then uh, all the parts in the middle you you sort of connected based on your model which resulted in actually an uplifting signal uh, in total um, can you say something or that was my impression wow. that the line was moving upwards somehow yeah, yeah, um, I'm sorry uh, to, uh, I, th uh, I mentioned it it's to only the raw time series so for this uh, for this individual um, for this example you connected to the seasonal displacement. So we did a, a long-term interferogram as well from the last uh, autumn interval uh, interfer uh, scene to the first coherent spring scene. So to connect them, and and it's it it is probably wrong. So this uplift is is not existing. I, I just wanted to show them a multi-annual uh, displacement time series. But what we are actually looking at is only the seasonal time series. We go only up to the first coherent scene uh, in spring and measure the, the displacements to the, to the turning point in, in late summer. So for the project, we look only at the individual uh, seasonal displacement. And because of the long time span in, in between, for the Lulizat case, we are not sure if we hit the right ambiguity so okay okay so so there's a large uh, uh, ratio yes, of uncertainty in there all right okay and that clarifies it uh, uh, thank you uh, i think uh, francesca we move on to the next the last talk i'm not sure whether there's a question yeah ah, there there's is. a question yeah there's a question for sean so malte will be uh there to to answer that so first of all uh the comment says, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. And then when the exact location of individual measurements was not established as desired, the relative position of positioning of the points seems still valuable for the formation analysis. What is your opinion on that? Um, well, <clears throat> first of all, um, we, we, we definitely think that this is valuable information, um, but it, it just, um, one, if when interpreting this data, has to be aware of that uh, the point location also within um, within the one um, stack processing uh, is not really reliable because it really depends on on the uh, the height of the substructures. Uh, so um, ideally, uh, we uh, we could use a, a lidar model uh, in the processing to correct for this, but we had we did not have this available. So we're using that, we could definitely um, improve this. Regarding combination of, um, of ascending and descending tracks to get also horizontal movement. So this seems to be uh, much more challenging uh, because the, the overall geolocation uh, is, is tricky because we do not have any, any reference points uh, around the structures. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've seen there, there is a question for me. So how was the difference between the JEP results with field data? Well, actually, we didn't measure any uh, uh, mathematical difference between the satellite observations and field data. We just wanted to get ground truth about the actual um, presence of uh, hazards and processes in the, in the field. So we haven't done any proper analytical validation, if, if this is what you mean. Um, okay. Are there any other uh, questions from the audience or any other questions from the speakers to other speakers? Um, I can't see any. Okay, maybe we can take this opportunity to uh, remind you that tomorrow at half past 11, there will be a technical session uh, with recommendations to ESA. So um, 
we would like to uh, warmly invite you to participate as a speakers of the session. And if there is any pressing technical issue or recommendation that you would like us to deliver to ISA, please let us know uh, either now or via the chat or via email. Um, Frank, do you do you think we can uh, ask any speakers to collaborate during the technical session? Maybe to uh, participate in the discussion? Yeah, maybe? sure, sure. Yeah, I think the floor is open to everyone during these sessions. Eh? Of course, we will uh, we will uh, present uh, prepare something to get started, but uh, then uh, obviously. Everyone's input is very valuable there. So uh, please, uh, please join tomorrow. So um, uh, uh, yeah, we can uh, we can uh, make this as efficient, effective as, as possible for the for the years ahead. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. So if there aren't any other questions now, maybe we can uh, just say goodbye and thank everybody for participating. So thanks also to you, Frank, for leading yeah. the sharing of the session. It was a pleasure. Definitely. And, <laughs> and see Me you too. in the next one. All right. See you in the next session. <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.